everyone, Tech Jax here. This is a continuation of our ERGRP configuration basics series. You know, we're just looking at some of the things that uh, can happen when you're setting up ERGRP, looking at some of the technology and, and what it is that we have to look out for, configure, and, and how to manipulate some of the things um, in it. Um, so with EIGRP, one of the best things about it is its convergence time. And the reason that EIGRP has such a high and fast convergence time is because of a thing called the feasible successor. A feasible successor is a route that's placed in the EIGRP topology and can be placed in the uh, routing table that will allow for EIGRP to route packets via that feasible successor if the successor routes go down. A successor route is a route that's considered the best route to a particular prefix or submat. So let's go ahead and look at our, our um, RIB real quick. <clears throat> and what you'll see here is that uh, we're learning about all the loopback interfaces from router 3 via fast ethernet segment 00, zero uh, this fast ethernet segment here. So the feasible distance uh, is this number here that shows up after administrative distance here. Uh, so 90 is the default administrative distance for internal uh, ERGRP routes. Uh, the feasible distance is the cost to get to this particular subnet. If we were to go to our show RP ERGRP topology, what we'll see here is that each one of these passive um, uh, statements is considered the successor route for those particular destinations. So to get to the 10.0.10.0 slash 24 network, we would use the route that's being supplied to us via the 10.10.11.2, which is here. So this connection to router uh, three is the best connection to get to this uh, interface and this subnet. And the feasible distance is the cost to get there. And this cost will be the lowest cost out of all the routes that are available if we had multiple routes. So one way to see if you have multiple routes is to go to the ERGRP topology all links. And once we go into uh, uh, ERGRP topology all links, we get to see that we do have alternative paths to get to that subnet. Um, we can take the serial interface from router 1 to router 2. However, that interface has a much higher cost in order to get to it. The feasible distance to get to that route is much higher, 2 million and something, uh, compared to the 409,000 of the fast Ethernet segment. However, the, what determines whether or not you're a feasible successor or not is the administrative distance. It's the cost of the router to get to that network. So the cost of router 2 to get to the router 3 uh, networks for those 10 subnets is 409,600. So you might be saying, well, well, that's the same as the feasible distance of the successor routes. And that's true. It costs the same amount for router 2 to get to the subnets on router 3 as it does for router 1 to get to the subnets on router 3. Why is that? because they're both using the same fast ethernet uh, connection. Uh, they have the same bandwidth, the same delay. So yes, uh, according to router two, it's the same cost to get to router three as it is for router one to get to router three. They have direct connections. So when the connection and when the administrative distance is the same as the feasible distance, it doesn't meet the condition to be a feasible successor. The feasible successor has to have a smaller, a lower uh, cost to get uh, to the uh, subnet or to the prefix um, than what the feasible distance is of the success successor. So uh, in order to like, um, you know, adjust that or make that happen, there's a couple of different methods you can use, one of which is preferred and one of which you can do, but it's not really preferred. So let's take a look at those quick methods real, real quick, 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 right? So. Uh, one way you can change the metrics and the cost uh, values is to change the K values that are being used to determine that metric. Uh, the K1 value and the K3 value. 
if you do show IP protocols, again, you'll see that the metric weight is being determined by the K1 value, which is determined by the bandwidth of that interface, and the K3 value, which is being determined by the delay of that interface. Now, by default, on serial interfaces, we have 1544 uh, for the bandwidth, and uh, for the delay value is 20,000. So this is what is used to determine that a feasible distance uh, for that route between router one and router two. That's why the cost is so much higher. Because if we were to go, on, go ahead and look at the interface for fast Ethernet uh, zero, 00, we'll get to see that our bandwidth is much higher. It's uh, 10,000 kilobits per second, um, and the delay is a lot lower at 1,000. So its value is a lot smaller, and which is why it's considered the best route. It has a lot more uh, bandwidth. Um, it's a lot faster and has a lot less delay. So this is why uh, that value is the value that is used and determined as the successor route. Whereas the, and let me go ahead and make sure you guys can see because I know my mouse cursor disappears when I'm recording. I've been looking at that. These are the values here under the fast Ethernet segment zero, 00 that determines the metric value and the cost value. And here it is for the serial interface, which is 1544 kilobits per second and a 20,000 delay. So when you're going to compare about getting to a particular location, you definitely will want to use the one that's going to get you there the fastest. And uh, the serial interface definitely doesn't help out when it comes to doing things as fast as that fast Ethernet uh, segment would indicate via its metrics. So we don't even really have to worry about the in, the serial interface because why it's the cost to the actual route from that router to that that subnet so it's routers to fast ethernet segment that we're going to have to make the delay uh or the bandwidth change on in order to make the feasible successes show up here because we want to make the administrative distance between router two and router three less than the administrative distance or the cost going from router one to router three so let's go ahead and hop on router two real quick and go to the fast ethernet zero fast and let's just go ahead and like change the delay we can change the delay to like 50 and on router three we'll go ahead and do the same because the k values have to match up that's the one thing about when you start configuring and changing k values is that you put at risk your adjacencies and your networking stability because uh the values have to be the same of you know, throughout the, 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 the domain when it comes to the ERGPK K values. So on router one, we go to the short ERGRP topology and that change has allowed for a successor route to now show up in our uh, ERGRP topology table. Um, I'm looking for here. Here's here's a, a demonstration of what it was just a few uh, moments ago. Our ERGP topology table for our autonomous system two, and as you can see, we had one successor route, which was the fast Ethernet route for each uh, prefix. We didn't have serial interface as being any of the uh, potential interfaces that could be routed out of. However, once we just made that change. You can see now in the ERGP topology table that, sorry, here it is here, that our administrative distance now, which was 409,600, and was the same as the feasible distance of the successor routes, is now smaller than what it was. Uh, so now these routes now qualify to be feasible successors, which means that if this link was to go down between R1 and R3, ERGRP will check the ERGRP topology table and then instantly put the feasible successor in place of that lost successor route. And that can stop the processor on the, C, uh, the, the CPU and the processing on that router from having to run a query and send out um, uh, query packets to all the other interfaces uh, and all the other routers um, except I mean it sends out a uh, query packet out of all interfaces except for the interface that went down and it asks all those interfaces if they know how to get to that subnet the 
uh, zero subnets that we have advertised on router three. So say we had like router four and router six over there and router eight over there and all that. They wouldn't know anything about this route over here, but router one would send out all these packets to all those other different routers. And what will end up happening is, is that if those routers had in, uh, issues as well, like with a uh, flapping interface and, and things like that, then they can get stuck and active. And then uh, you have a situation in which your domain cannot converge because of a, a, a stuck in active storm and things like that. So usually in those scenarios, I mean, there are things you can do like set up ERGP stubs and things like that and summarization that prevents routers from sending out query uh, packets uh, to routers that, that shouldn't know and have no idea about certain uh, subnets and advertisements because of the way that the network was designed. So in this particular case, if this segment went down, it, R1 wouldn't have to send out query packets because it would already have a feasible successor to get to that route via R2 and R3. Now, if we were going to go ahead and check our show IP route, the successor routes are the only routes that are showing up as being uh, the best routes available. Uh, it's only going to route via Fast Ethernet 00, zero now because. Uh, one thing that you do have to set is a variance if you actually want to do uh, unequal cost uh, load sharing or load balancing uh, if that's what you want to do in ERGRP. So even though router 1 to router 2 in that serial interface now has an administrative distance that's less than the feasible distance and packets can be routed there, because say that we did want to route packets via uh, R1 and R2 over that serial interface. Let's just say for whatever reason somebody says that we want to be able to route packets between uh, R1 and R2 as well as R1 and R3 for those uh, 10 subnets. Um, you would have to set a variance if that if those links didn't have equal cost because by default ERGRP does equal cost load sharing. Um, if you didn't have equal cost then you can go into the router config and you would set a variance and the variance allows you to be able to route packets over unequal uh, links and if we set a value of two that means that the value can be twice as high or twice as bad as the best link and in that scenario if we go ahead and enable a variance we can do show IP route let's go ahead and wait The route is not good enough. <laughs> That's one of the things. Because the feasible distance is 409,600, if we were going to use a variance of two, that would take us up to around, what, 900,000? Whereas the feasible distance of our serial interfaces is 2 million. So our variance wouldn't be able to actually uh, cover uh, how large of a di uh, difference it was between the cost of taking one route over the other. So we'd have to set a much higher variance, uh, probably around six, um, in order to actually have that be the case. So let's go ahead and do that. So this means that the, 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 the cost uh, can be six times as bad as the successor route. And that was enough to cover the difference. As you can see now in our Shore IP route, we're able to route packets via uh, both uh, interfaces now, our serial interface and our fast ethernet interface. Our Fast Ethernet interface is still our successor interface. It's the best route, but it can also route packets via the serial interface. And if you wanted to do things like with setting like a percentage for uh, how much one particular link should be used over another one when it comes to load sharing, then you can do so. Um, but however, if we wanted to take a look and see like how many packets were being uh, traversed uh, one link over the other one, we can do a show IP route. We can do a route like 10.0.7.0. 
And as you can see, uh, the star indicates which one is the best route, the preferred route, uh, and um, the route that's being used uh, right now. If you had equal load sharing and both links had the same cost, then this asterisk can actually, uh, depending on when you actually enter the command to view it, uh, can change uh, at any given time. But this route would always be considered the best route because of its um, uh, route metric versus this route metric here. And this route metric is the best, so that's why its traffic share count is 240, whereas the traffic uh, share count on this segment, which is serial interface 00, is 43. It's much lower because of the, um, it, it's, 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 not, it's not as good as a link. <laughs> so it's going to be used less, unless you configure it specifically to be used just as much. So that's how you would configure and make a change on a link in order to uh, manipulate the K values in order to get a value to show up as a successor route or uh, I mean a feasible successor route. Now that's not a way that's being recommended. It's not something that you want to do in production. You don't want to go changing K values. Again, your K values have to match up across the domain in order to have your adjacencies form. And uh, the best way to go ahead and do some of the things that we just did would be to actually create an offset list. And what I'll go ahead and do is actually go ahead and set um, my 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 uh, interfaces back to the default value, and then we can look real quick at how to turn this into a a way to uh, implement an offset list in order to have our feasible successor route show up, just as just as uh, though we did with changing that interface value. So I'll go ahead and configure this, and then we'll return for the uh, remaining portion of this video.